Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up in this episode, we get all the news and top-selling Spectrum games from March 1987. We take a look at the Brazilian Spectrum clones. I review some older games. I play a new title. Jeff looks at some more willies. And we end with a bit of fun. But first, it's the news. Martek have discovered a problem with their game distribution plant, and as a result, the wrong version of their judo game, Uchimata, has made its way out to the public. This version is not the full release, and is in fact an early preview of the game. Martek are asking that anyone who purchased this game to check that the score returns to zero when you begin a new game. If not, then you can return it and get the full version free of charge. The popular television show, Grange Hill, will soon be available on your spectrum. The game allowed you to take control of Hollow as he tries to break into school to retrieve his confiscated Walkman. The game will use a menu-driven system similar to Nighttime, and there are plenty of other characters to interact with, at least according to the publisher Argus. This could also be the first game to have a moral message for the player. If you encounter a drug dealer and interact with him in any way, the game ends and you have to start all over again. Hey, morals in a game, eh? Whatever next. Continuing with the license theme, and US Gold have finally sealed the deal to produce a game based on the Indiana Jones movies. They announced their intent last summer, without even having the license, so it's a relief all round that they actually got it. The game should be ready in about a year's time. The BBC computer show Micro Live has been dropped from the schedules. The show that covers both home and business machines is currently being discussed by the BBC's planning team, with no future date yet set for the next series. With the Plus 2 and soon to arrive Plus 3 models, older stocks of the 1 to 8K Spectrum are being sold off at ever cheaper prices. Dixon's has now dropped their price to an astonishing £89.95p. This is for the machine only though, without any software packs or joystick, but it's still a great deal. The Spectrum is still outselling its nearest rival, the Commodore 64, by 2 to 1, according to the newly released Christmas sales figures. And with the new Plus 3 machine about to arrive, hopefully we'll see this continuing. With rumours of the new Plus 3 machine, several magazines were leading on the story. However, I just wanted to share this one with you, from Sinclair User. I don't really know where they got the picture from, but it's certainly, shall we say, a little bit odd. And that was the news. And now on to the top selling games. New into the chart this month is Cobra, the game of the film from Ocean Software. Super Soccer, a football game from Imagine. Gauntlet, the arcade conversion from US Gold. And Space Harrier, another arcade conversion, this time from Elite. And that was the news and top selling games from March 1987. As reported in the computer press around March 1986, what is thought to be the first Spectrum clone was making headlines although the computer itself was launched much earlier. The story of the clone and the people that made it begins in 1981, when the Cavari brothers set up an electronics company called Micro Digital in Brazil. At the time there was tremendous financial unrest in the country, and the government enforced a policy blocking the import of any computer related goods, and also banning external companies from moving in. This meant that, although many other countries were beginning to enjoy the first wave of home micros, Brazil was practically frozen out. Micro Digital took another approach, and instead of investing in research and design, they simply imported computers, changed their name, and sold them as their own. They first did this with the ZX80 and ZX81, naming them the TK82 and TK85 respectively. These machines were more or less direct clones of the Sinclair versions. The next machine they aimed for was the Tandy Color 2, 
but despite announcing their version, the TKS 800, it never made it to production. At this time, the Sinclair Spectrum was outselling other home micros in the UK, making it an ideal target for the company, who were now not only just cloning machines, but modifying them. The TK90X, the first Spectrum clone, was launched in June 1985 to the eager Brazilian user base. The unit itself is very similar in size and design to the UK Spectrum, but has a diagonal pattern across the top, very reminiscent of the Atari ST. The keyboard remains the dead flesh rubber blocks, each with the familiar keywords and sub-functions, although beep has been replaced by sound. The fascia differs slightly, with larger emphasis on the colours, and of course the micro-digital logo at the lower right. Inside, the circuit board looks very familiar. Although there isn't an internal speaker, the sound instead was output via the RF lead into your television. On the back, and again very familiar, apart from the added joystick port. And it even came with a converted Horizons tape, replacing the English language with their own. Although borrowing heavily from the Spectrum, and looking very similar, the machine had a few differences. As mentioned before, there was a built-in joystick port that was Interface 2 compatible. There was a modified UDG set with accented characters for Portuguese and Spanish. There was a trace command for debugging and a built-in UDG editor. And a digital ULA instead of an analog one that Sinclair used. The machine also ran at 60Hz instead of Sinclair's 50 and this meant games ran slightly faster. Compare the music from Cobra for example. This is the familiar 50Hz version. And here is the TK90X version. These changes though caused some games not to work, for example 3D Death Chase but the number was relatively small compared to the hundreds of titles that began to flood into the country, not all of them official. As with the UK, there was a thriving pirate trade which helped to sell this computer. News of this success eventually reached Sinclair, who filed a lawsuit against Microdigital for copyright infringement. Sinclair lost and the machine continued to sell. Later, Microdigital released an updated version, the TK95. This unit has a much improved keyboard with real keys and a full size spacebar. The styling had changed too, making it much more distinctive and quite attractive. Inside the ROM had been modified to try and improve compatibility, but it had the adverse effect of making games that previously loaded fail. But this didn't stop the machine from selling. The expansion port on both machines was compatible with existing hardware, and even modern devices like the Divide Ye work fine. Micro Digital did release a few peripherals for the Micro, including a light pen, but they mainly stuck to the computers themselves. Today the machine is highly sought after by collectors, particularly in the UK, where it is seen as a rare addition to any serious collection and in its own country, it's regarded in the same way as the UK does the Sinclair model. It's a childhood favourite, holding memories of playground game copying, and excitement about new games and long programming sessions. There are still TK and Spectrum meetings, and new games being written for them. If you want to see one of these machines, the Centre for Computing History in Cambridge has one in its collection. It's great to look at how the TK90X and the TK95 came to market, and see how far Sinclair's ideas spread. Good luck, kid. Renegade was released into the arcades by Tato in 1986 and was one of the popular breeds of beat em up. It follows the usual story, you have to rescue your girlfriend, and to do this you have to fight your way through different levels and different bad guys. Home machines were quick to pick it up, and the Spectrum version was released a year later. Released by Imagine, 
the game came in two flavours, 48 and 128k. Both games are the same, apart from the 128k version, which includes additional sound and music, as you would expect. I'll be honest at this point and say that beat em ups are not my favourite type of game, and you'll probably see that I can't play them very well, but let's have a try. The first screen, and there are a few men you have to take care of. Some of them have sticks, which is a little bit unfair, and these are very dangerous. Avoiding them is tricky, and the keyboard certainly takes a pounding. The variety of moves, like the arcade, is impressive, with punches, kicks, knees and jumps, all being handled by four directions and the hit button. Playing these style games very rarely meant that it took me a while to get past the initial level. I found the jump kicks to be more effective, often taking out your opponent in one shot. These had to be timed though, as the other men soon surrounded you. The next level and the jump kicks are used again to get rid of the motorbike riders before finishing off the rest of the gang. At times this game can be very frustrating. Just as you are lining up a kick, you get hit from behind and as soon as you stand up, the same guy smacks you again. The graphics are great, with well drawn and well animated characters and the fighting animation is really good. The backgrounds are nice too and don't distract too much from the action. To see the other levels though, I had to use the RZX playback, because I'm just not good enough to get there myself. Sound is used well on both machines, although the 128K version is certainly the better of the two. Control is good, and controlling your character is really easy, which is a hard thing to pull off for beat-em-ups. If you're into these games, then this is a fine example, well converted from the arcade and nice to play. It's also a good game for people like me who don't usually play beat-em-ups. There isn't complicated multi-combo moves to master, just four directions and a hit button, making for a good learning curve. A great game then, especially for beat-em-up fans. This is Antics, the follow-up to The Birds and the Bees, released by Bugbite Software in 1984. You play Barnaby on a mission to rescue Boris the bee who has been kidnapped by ants and hidden deep in their nest. You have to contend with things like ants that follow you around, ladybirds that reduce your stamina, spikes and a menagerie of other nasty things that can cause Barnaby damage. This maze exploration game also has a sneaky trick. Some of the passages are hidden and only by colliding with them are they revealed. This means that you have to fly about, bumping into things that look like they could lead somewhere. And this is where the fun lies with this game, at least until you know where all the hidden passages are. Some are only made visible by collecting pollen too, so it's a real challenge to find the right path to Boris, while keeping your stamina up. The levels of both stamina and pollen are visible at the top of the screen, and these can be replenished by bumping into plants and collecting the pollen. The graphics, as you can see, are basic, but well drawn and smooth. The control, though, is a bit odd, and unique for this game. You have left, right and fly, and that's all. To move down, you just stop flying. But, flying uses stamina, so you have to use the floors to move wherever possible. Some of the characters are not animal based either. There's things like a bouncing ball and a flapping memory chip, and the famous Bug Bite logo. Sound is nice to begin with. The constant music is quite good, for about the first few minutes, then it becomes very annoying. Luckily though, you can switch it off, leaving just the sparse sound effects. Once you battle your way through the inner levels, and to Boris himself, you then have to drag him all the way back to the hive to complete the game, and this gives it an extra element. You have limited stamina, and now you have Boris in tow as well, and he's not the brightest of bees, 
and you often have to wait for him to catch up. If I had to complain about one thing, it would be lining up Barnaby with a small entrance. Because of the fly mechanics, it can sometimes be tricky, and this allows ants to catch up with you and drain your stamina. It's not the most graphically impressive game, and yet I like it, apart from that annoying music of course. It's a fair game, easy to get into, and has a lasting challenge, even though I never rescued poor Boris. An early game then that's certainly worth a look. This is Wanderers, Chained in the Dark, released in 2014 by Sam Style. It is one of those rare things on a spectrum, a turn-based role-playing game, and what's more, it's excellent. Although I couldn't find any backstory, and the intro refused to play, instead showing me a cat, there's not a lot you really need to know, as the story comes out through playing the game. You will quickly meet a man who tells you of a demon that needs destroying. And you'll also find a little girl hiding, who asks you to save her father. Straight away you are thrown into quests. The menu system is really good and easy to use, allowing you to talk, give, pick up, use and operate items you come across. And it won't be long before you're into your first fight with some spiders. The typical role-based gameplay kicks in, and you can choose to attack, use a potion, or use magic. As you attack, the spider loses health, and they attack you back, so you have to keep an eye on yours. With a bit of luck and some magic, you'll soon be celebrating your first victory. The plot slowly unfolds and more quests are thrown at you. This, along with some excellent music, really immerses you into the game world. As you can see, the graphics are fantastic. Well drawn and smooth, with some lovely detailed backgrounds. Sound too is used well, and this is one of those games that draws you in. And before long a few hours have flown by, and you still want to continue. I can't really praise this game enough. It's a great change from platform games or maze games, and shows just what the little machine can do. There's so much dialogue in the game too, and nice touches to be found, and even a bit of humour. All in all then, a brilliant game, so go and grab it now. There are 101 Jet Set Willy mods on the world of Spectrum. I've played them all, and these are some of my favourites. Today we're going to take a look at Join the Jet Set. Join the Jet Set was written in 1985 by Richard G. Hallas. Yep, that's right, as long ago as 1985 people were writing Jet Set Willy mods. Now, I remember coming to this through the internet a long, long time ago and reading about how Richard had come to create this game. Also, there's a bit of blurb on the World of Spectrum website about how he came to create this game. What actually happened is Richard found in a local software shop a cassette with, I think he said it was a handwritten inlay for the Jet Set Willy editor, and apparently this was Software Projects Approved. And he took this home and he wanted to make a game that was in the style of Jet Set Willys. And Join the Jet Set was the result. The guy who wrote the Jet Set Willy editor was called Paul Rhodes. And I think what I read a while ago was that after years and years, Richard went back into his parents' attic and found the Jet Set Willy editor and his old tapes of Join the Jet Set. And with a bit of help from a guy named Barry Pelwer, he converted these to TAF files and SNAP files and uploaded them to the World of Spectrum website. Now what I really love about the World of Spectrum website is that you can find things that you'd never have been able to get back in the day. Back in 1985 there was no way I was ever going to play Join the Jet Set unless I was a friend of Richard's. 
but these days you can go on the World of Spectrum website and find them. So looking at the game, the first thing I'd say about the game is when you look at the map, the map of the game is a square. Now I think I remember reading that Richard said he'd done this so that all the rooms were easily accessible and it was easier to edit that way if they were all just touching each other and in a square. Now I'm sure that's true, but the other thing that does is kind of make them all close by so they're all really close and accessible. Unlike Jet Set Willy itself, where you seem to have to go a long way to find some of the rooms. Some of the mods that I'll talk about, some of them are quite linear and you seem to be going a long, long way before you find anything. Everything's close together and quite accessible, although some of the rooms are quite difficult to get to still. The next thing I'd say about the game is, Richard said he wanted to do something in the style of Jet Set Willy, and he really did do that. There are loads of really good new rooms that you think, yeah, this is reminiscent of Jet Set Willy, this is the kind of thing that Matthew Smith would have done. One of the things I really like is if you go into the room Sweet Dreams and into the Wide Blue Yonder, there are kind of blown up huge big versions of characters within the game, Maria and the Bird in that case. Also what Richard did is he reused some of the original Jet Set Willy rooms. The Bow and the Yacht are in there, as are Out on a Limb and the Treetop. Now, he did this kind of sparingly, he didn't do it too much, he just reused them, moved them around and kind of used them for his own benefit in the game. So it doesn't feel cheap or like he's cheated or that he's done it in a way that was a bit lazy, it's actually in keeping with the game. Then of course there's some kind of clever in jokes in there. So there's the big hello from Richard Hallas, it was one of the rooms which is a big hello. The entrance to Hades is there. I like the live or let die room that is next to Hades as well. The off license and the on license is quite good, one being a mirror image of the other. And we'll come to mirror images later in this series. Then of course there was the old hoax in, I think it was your spectrum, that said if you wait on the bow until a really really late time in the game, a raft comes along and it'll take you to a desert island. And Richard actually put that into the game, so from the from the bow, you can actually walk on the sea now, it's not deadly, you don't need to wait for any rafts, and you can go to a desert island. So all of these things come together, it's kind of a tribute to Jet Set Willy itself and some of the, the folklore, but also has some new ideas in there. I don't think when you go through the game, any of the rooms are really out of keeping. Some of the rooms are really difficult. I remember playing this for a long time and thinking to myself, wow, wow, that's difficult. And some some rooms, some of the objects, you think, how am I going to get there? And it actually takes you quite a while to figure out how you're going to get to a certain object in a certain room. But that doesn't detract from the games. Some Jet Set Willy mods, you start playing and they feel difficult from the very, very first moment you start playing. And that put me off some of them, put me off quite a few of them. Whereas with this, where it's difficult, it reminds me of how Jet Set Willy's difficult. You'll be going along, everything will seem fine, you feel like you're making a lot of progress, then all of a sudden you reach a point and you go, hold on, I'm stuck here. I need to sit down and think and work out how on earth I get through this piece of room, or how on earth I collect this object. And I don't think there's a lot more to say about this than that. It is well worth checking out. All of the mods that will be in this series will be well worth checking out. But this is the first, the first and original Jet Set Willy mod in a way, and a really, really good one. And I think it's set up the kind of level of things to come, which is why it's one of the very first in this list. Till next time, happy gaming. Sword Fight, or to give it its full name, Sword Fight at Midnight, is, according to the cassette inlay, more of a simulation than a game. It was released by Sunshine Books in 1983, and there are instructions included if you can be bothered to read through the presentation that soon becomes boring. There's five difficulty levels, ranging from impossible to easy, and I'll be playing on easy for this review. You control your fighter using five keys, left, right, parry, thrust and prepare. Parry blocks your opponent's thrust, thrust does what it says and attacks your opponent doing damage, and prepare raises your sword over your shoulder 
and should be followed quickly by a thrust to deliver a more powerful blow. After a bit of practice in two-player mode, it became apparent that you cannot just sit there in the thrust position, you have to hammer the parry thrust keys repeatedly to do damage. So, armed with that, it's time to take on the computer. It's straight in for the attack, and you are player two when facing the computer, and can see your health status at the bottom right. Hammering the keys will eventually see one of you dead, and if you're lucky, it won't be you. And that's it. That's the entire game. Oh, sorry, simulation. There's no real skill involved. Just luck, really. You could try to parry, I suppose, but it didn't really work for me. The graphics, as you can see, are line-drawn and pretty poor. There's no animation as such. The characters just switch positions. The background is just there to fill space, as far as I can see, and I'm not really sure what it's supposed to be. I mean, is that a lighthouse or a phallic symbol? Sound is minimal with just a few clicks and a terrible siren when you die, but at least I suppose it doesn't play the death march. It's a pretty bad game really, even for 16k. There's no skill, no progression, it's just luck. If you win, you have to start the game again and select a higher level, rather than progressing on to the next opponent. Oh well, I play these games so you don't have to. Those of you who follow my Twitter feed will have seen that I recently found an old laptop at work and instantly set about getting a Spectrum emulator onto it. It turned out not to be as easy as I had hoped, but let's introduce the device first. It's a Compaq LTE Elite 440CX. Released in the early 90s, this machine runs at 40 MHz. It's got 8 MB of RAM and a 360 MB hard drive. That's megabytes. At the front, there's a 3.5 inch 1.44 MB floppy drive. Around the side, there are two PCM CIA slots. And at the back, there's a serial port, a parallel port, a PS2 port, a VGA port, and another expansion port. The 8.5 inch screen is colour, but has really bad reflection problems that caused issues when trying to grab footage. On the side of the screen is a small trackball that is used to control the mouse pointer with the left and right buttons on the opposite side. I opted to use the mouse that came with it though, the standard compact ball mouse. Powering this thing on and the hard drive spins up, the memory ticks up and after a few seconds we get the DOS prompt. Remember that? Going into Windows is easy and we have Windows for Workgroups 311. The familiar layout greets us and the memories come flooding back. But now onto the more serious matter, getting a Spectrum emulator onto this machine. I would need one that uses low powered hardware, so opted for Warayevo. Next I had to get it onto the machine. Remember, this machine hasn't got USB ports, there's no CD, there's no SD card slots, that left just the floppy. But upon putting a disc in, it made this noise. And not surprisingly, it didn't work. Now what? The only option I had left was serial transfer. So I dug out my old null modem cable, plugged it all in, loaded up Windows Terminal, and then discovered that Microsoft no longer provided the terminal emulation program with Windows 10. Hmm, great. After a few hours of searching and testing, I finally got a nice little program called TerraTerm. It was quick to set up, and I was ready to start transferring things at the fastest the laptop could receive, which was 19,200 board. Using the X modem protocol, I sent the files one at a time, across the slow serial link. Finally, it was time to fire up the emulator. The interface is designed for DOS, so this may look primitive to some younger viewers, but this was state of the art in the 90s. There are many settings and features on offer, including microdrive emulation, 1 to 8K emulation, real time tape loading via Sound Blaster, if you had one, accurate timing, and much, much more. To play a game, you selected the start button, 
select the game you wanted to play, which can be in any number of formats, and select OK, and if you're lucky, the game will start. The gameplay I think is a little fast, but not enough to notice unless you've played the same game on another emulator or the real hardware just before loading up. The laptop produced low sound levels and I couldn't find any way to boost it. I tested a few games and they all worked flawlessly. I then decided to try Aquaplane. This game splits the border to give a full screen effect and needs accurate timing and emulation to look right. Warievo had problems initially until I adjusted the border settings and then it worked perfectly. It was great to use this old hardware again with an emulator that I'd not seen before. It brought back many memories and I spent quite a few days trying out different games. I wonder if my work will notice if I don't take this back. <laughs>